Damn it. You're looking at a video? No, I don't, uh, okay, just, you go, okay. You gonna sing? <laughs> So my name is Ben McKenzie, and I played guitar in Times Tide. So uh, Times Tide started uh, honestly because I wore a Youth of Today shirt at a show. So I moved to Edmonton in late 2012. I think it was like a Comeback Kid show in like November or something like that. There was a guy there who was like, oh, cool shirt. And that guy was John Weber. And he and I got talking, kind of became friends that night. Uh, he introduced me to a bunch of other people in the scene. I was brand new to the city, so I didn't know anybody. Um, I didn't know, you know, the who's who, what bands there were, anything like that. So that night, actually, I met Byron Mayer. My name is Byron. Uh, I played drums in Times Tide, um, and yeah. <laughs> Started in 2013, but it might have been early 2000, summer of 2013, or summer of 2012. Uh, I was at a show. I played in a band called Breakbeat. Uh, with some other guys and I think we were playing a show at Oliver Hall and there was a guy named John Weber who uh, wanted to start a band with me. Humming and hawing about it, I was already in I think two or three other bands at the time um, so I was kind of not really sure, I was kind of busy with stuff but then eventually um, you know we got talking more and he introduced me to Ben McKenzie uh, who played guitar and you know great dude um so i thought what the hell why not let's let's start a jam like you know these are both two cool dudes so let's see what happens and drive up to this house in short part knock on the door i remember it was raining out knock on the door no answer ring the doorbell no answer john gives byron a call and byron's like yeah i gave you guys the wrong address you're at the wrong house so good thing no one was home because John Weber and I were knocking on the door and ringing the doorbell of some random person's house in, in Sherwood Park. <laughs> so we started jamming at, in my basement at my parents' house, uh, summer of 2013. I think we had two or three jams and at the third jam, I believe John Weber decided he didn't want to do vocals. Um, so he bought a bass and he was like, oh, I'm going to play bass in the band. And we were like, okay, uh, but who's going to do vocals? And John and Ben knew a guy named Colton. I met him at a show in January. I think it was Title Fight came um, and played at the Avenue Theater. And so I called Colton up. I said, hey man, do you want to be in a band or do you want to check us out or whatever? And he was like, yeah, sure, I'll try it out. I think I met him once. I remember, I think it was at Richie Hall. I think it was Expire I met him. Um, and he was wearing a full house shirt, I'm pretty sure. And I was like, oh, yo, full house, I love that band, that's sick. Um, but he was, he was pretty hesitant at first. He was a pretty shy guy back in 2013. Didn't really, you know, do a lot of things where he interacted socially with people. And we started talking a little bit and I instantly kind of like, I like this dude because he was kind of weird. Um, so we got Colton to come out and I don't remember this as well, but I know Byron remembers it, where Colton came to band practice, went down to Byron's basement, and sat there with a ski helmet. He found a ski helmet. I knew it was gonna be a good band when Colton didn't say probably more than 10 words the entire jam and found a snowboard helmet of mine and put it on his head and sat on the concrete pavement and just sat there. And that's, he watched us practice. That kick is beefy. No! No! <laughs> um, 
I gotta intro myself first. I remember, I, I think I screamed, I just can't win or something. And uh, I remember Byron looking at me like, whoa, yeah, no, we're, we're good here. Yeah, this is gonna work out. Three of us decided that Colton's gonna be a good fit. Colton decides that we're gonna be a good fit. I know that Colton was really, really apprehensive about it at first, and he actually came over to my house that fall to get help with writing lyrics. Then, you know, bombshell that September, we had like finally found a show, and then John Weber was like, guys, I'm gonna move away. And so then we had to scramble to find somebody who could play guitar, so we picked up uh, Joel Frost, who was a friend of mine. Do we sell crack in Jabba's? We're not doing it! We're selling like a mascot! We're not doing chill crack to the guns and blaze guys! My name's Joel. <laughs> 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 I'm a band at a Christian young adult group, which is yeah, very funny in hindsight. And he came up to me after our first meeting and I was wearing like a terror shirt and uh, Ben was just like, hey man, like, I see you're wearing a terror shirt. Do you like hardcore? I was like, yeah. And he's like, cool. <laughs> So they needed a bassist. Um, so yeah, I filled in. I was technically just to fill in for that first show. Um, then pretty quickly after that, it was just like, yeah, well, we're not going to try to find a straight edge bassist. So <laughs> he hopped in originally just to be a fill in, but it's Joel and we love him, so he stayed in. The reason why we wanted to start a band was because we wanted to start a straight edge band in the Edmonton scene. We basically started the band because we wanted to be a straight edge band because uh, there wasn't any uh, strange bands in Edmonton or the surrounding areas, I believe, at the time. It actually worked out really well. Um, we all kind of just like came together and our chemistry just really worked. Uh, there was a lot of like beatdown influence. There was a lot of like really, really heavy, slow music and, you know, down tuning. Everybody was down tuning. And I was just like, I'm not into that. Like I want fast music. I want energetic music. I want something that's going to, I just wanted something that was like, gave you energy rather than like drained you. And I don't even remember who we played with on our first show. Um, and that was, it was stressful because that was also like one of my first shows as a promoter. Um, <laughs> So we were asked shortly thereafter to play a show the next weekend, um, which we took up. But after that, we got invited to go on a tour with uh, like a really mini tour with a band called Low Level out of Edmonton and to play in the middle of January uh, in Edmonton, Calgary and Regina. Just do those three cities really quick. And what I remember is we were so unprepared for that tour, but we were like, let's, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's try it. So. We all piled into my car, which was a 2002 Nissan Sentra, which is not very big. We would booked it out, like Ben had, you know, because he loves maps so much, had already looked at a map and found the shortest route to like take around Western Canada. Yeah, Ben even had it like calculated how much gas should cost us in each province and stuff based on like 
what the median gas price was for that province, which is just fucking... A couple things I remember about that tour. Number one, it was absolutely freezing cold. It was like minus 50 that weekend. Um, low Levels van did not start in Regina. That's how cold it was in Regina. It was really cold. The vehicle low level had a sunroof that like got stuck open and then their battery was also dead so we were all like taking turns sitting in our car and also then standing outside to like, like, I don't know, make sure everyone was warm. It was minus 50 and I don't think I've ever felt that cold in my entire life and I'm pretty sure as soon as we opened the door all of us thought the exact same thing as why the fuck are we here? and I had half a meatball subway sub. Um, I remember being real hungry and putting that on the, the middle of the dash uh, to defrost, because I thought it would for some reason, um, even though it was like frozen, like rock hard at that point. There was just, you know, this giant patch of ice like going down like his windshield, because I wouldn't move this fucking sub. And so he was like driving like this, but. That was pretty, pretty gross. We went to some weird fucking bar and like I don't remember where it was. Was that the was that the night that we went to this bar and Joel started dancing with somebody who had like a weird name? I can't even like Nightshade or something. I think at one point I was trying to bait some dude who had gotten kicked out into trying to fight the bouncer because I thought it would be really funny. And everyone else was trying to like, no, Joel, like we should leave. And I was like, no, he's going to do it. Like, like this is going to be really funny. He's going to get knocked out. I remember sitting on the couch and then waking up like seven hours later on the ground and just like no recollection how I ended up there. I just really needed to pee though. So I like went into the bathroom and uh, Justin, the drummer from Low Levels, just like sleeping in the tub, just like, like snoring peacefully there. Like his head was right next to the toilet though. And I was just like, ah, I don't like want to like piss right next to his head. That's kind of rude. So I just like pulled like the shower curtain and just like peed and then like flushed. That's what I remember. He said he was sleeping in the bathtub. I didn't have to sleep in the bathtub. I got the floor, so that was pretty nice. Justin's just sitting there just like, <laughs> just looking at me, I was like, on the light on or off, and he was like, off. <laughs> yeah. Practice. It was always chaotic. I lived in South Edmonton. Colton lived in Stony Plain. Byron lived in Sherwood Park, and Joel lived in Capilano. And so, getting us all to the same place at the same time was a big hassle. And they had like just like this very nice house, and I remember just being like even scared to use a bathroom. I'm gonna make it dirty somehow in here and they're, they're gonna know. Everyone almost always was late. We almost always were eating junk food. I remember getting into a lot of arguments in my parents' basement uh, between all of us. I remember for whatever reason, there'd be like a topic that would come up and <laughs> Colton would have some ha smart ass remark and it would kind of snowball. Fucking geese. I hate you geese. I want you here. Ben was kind of just the level-headed dad. He would kind of just like, you know, make sure things went well. Byron somewhat regularly would screw up his days and his times, which is really frustrating. But many times we showed up to Byron's house for jam and he had forgotten that he had booked jam and was like at West Ed or something. <laughs> Rather like... We were not like a lot of other like punk hardcore bands. Like we weren't jamming in some dingy, gross space. We were jamming in a nice house on a cul-de-sac in Shore Park. So we'd pull up, you know, to these immaculate houses in our junky little cars with a little bit of our gear and we'd pile into Byron's house and then go practice in his basement and make a ton of noise. It was always super loud. We practiced a lot, um, and that was a big thing because we all really wanted to sound really like tight and clean. We started recording past lives, like soundproof doors and walls and 
it was really cool. It was my first real experience in an actual studio. Uh, and we were all there all the time, like all four of us. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well because we didn't like how they sounded afterwards. And then he ended up losing, I think, three out of the five songs we had. So we had to basically scrap them all. We got back our first set of mixes from Nick and we were just like, oh my gosh, this does not sound good. I think we were fully done or we were almost like 90% done. And then we got a message from the guy recording us. Nick gave me a call and was like, so I lost your stuff. I lost your stuff. We have no recordings and we have no music and we have no way to print it now because it's too late. We're like, fuck. I remember scrambling and being so fucking mad that we that we didn't have those tracks because that was we were banking on that. We were gonna book the tour. Uh, and then for the tour we were gonna release Past Lives and that was gonna be our like our fledged thing, our little baby. We talked to Jesse Bruget um, about that. Um, and yeah, he's just yeah, a solid dude and he's like Yep, he's like, we can bang something together real quick, but it's not gonna be like, perfect. We rushed and we found Jesse Berger and we got him to uh, record three songs on one day. It was really anticlimactic to come out with those three songs actually, um, but that's what we did. We, I think we just gave away download codes. I don't even think we charged anyone for it. No, I burnt CDs. That's right, I put them on my laptop and I burned a hundred demos, and I still have number one in my closet. And I think we just gave them away, because we were still done at that point. We were like, just fucking listen to us. And if you like it, cool, come to the show, and if you don't, that's sweet too, but here you go. The tour, I remember, was really up and down, really big gong show, really, like, I mean, it's amazing that we survived <laughs> too hard, to be honest. It's funny how, like, prepped you can be and plan for something and then just like, you know, things just don't go well. Touring was a really big deal for all of us because uh, none of us really did any tours before then other than Ben, I believe. Luckily for Times Tide um, and mostly for Byron and I, because Byron and I were kind of useless when it came to any adulting in this band. We did like the merch designs and ideas for like song orders and stuff, but all the all the booking for shows and tours and recording and uh, all the navigation of that was all Ben and Joel. Uh, we were really excited to go, organized pretty well. Overall, there was not that great of turnouts. Lost a ton of money. You don't get paid any money as a local hardcore band. We had a ton of amazing experiences. I remember sleeping for probably 75% of the tour. I had a seat in the way back in the van, and we just had our gear back there too. We didn't call it a trailer. And, uh, I would sleep with a tire iron next to me in the van because um, I'd never want to stay in anyone's house. Um, so I try my best to just stay in the van. You're young and depressed on tour, you kind of just get through it. It's fun, but you don't pay attention as much as you think you are. We had our friend uh, Josh Toplift come with us. I believe he wanted to also come because he wanted to meet a girl that lived in Vancouver. And so we were like, oh yeah, what the hell, why not, man? Come along. And so we did. And he went on a date with that girl, and then it turns out that, you know, they really clicked, and then eventually they got married. So that's kind of cool. And... Calgary and Colton woke me up in the morning with, Are you fucking diabetic? <laughs> and I have a DVD at Septum, and I smoke a lot, so I do breathe weird when I sleep, but. <laughs> um, bronchitis. Yeah. I remember being way more stoked on. <laughs> Touring is really tiring, uh, but shows are really fulfilling, but they really suck the life out of you if no one's there. The first show was in my hometown, was in Dauphin, and so we drove out there and we played uh, at a lake house. <laughs> And there was like flooding at the time. So I remember we had to drive over like a road that was almost washed out to get to the cabin where we were playing. And then we went to Winnipeg the next next night was a good turnout, but no one watched us. Us and Cold Lungs, nobody came to watch us. They watched the Winnipeg bands and then they left. <laughs>
Um, Brandon was a weird show. Nothing good ever happens in Brandon, Manitoba. I remember the sun was rising when we pulled into Regina because we drove all night and uh, we stayed at Nathan's house. Thanks, Nathan. He always put us up in Regina, which is sweet. I, I don't even remember where we were, but it was like 2.30 in the morning again and I was texting Ben's sister. I was just like, hey, Joel, who are you texting? And I was just like, Ben's sister. And like, Ben was just visibly just, <sighs> Oh, don't do that. No, don't, don't. Love to bug men. To Calgary and then Kelowna and then Vancouver, but we didn't have a show until Vancouver because all the other shows kind of fell through. This is hardcore. Other things may change. We start and end with family. And your friends are here. Hold on. This is family. Hardcore is family. I'm Pazzy Ben. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you stick with your family in hardcore. <laughs> God damn it. We got to Vancouver and I remember playing 333. It was a ton of fun. It was really packed. So sweaty. That show was probably the sweatiest one I've ever played. And then we drove back to Calgary to play a show there. And then we headed back to Edmonton to write and start recording again. For us, the rest of 2014, the big focus was getting the record actually out. Ben and Joel were just kind of like, oh, you know, let's just like bust it out and just spend whatever just to get the music out. I remember I really wanted to record with uh, one of our friends, Jesse Bruget. I knew a guy from the shirt park named Quinn. Jesse Berger did the guitars and the bass and the vocals. I asked him if he could record drums for us. Um, and he was like, yeah, that's totally, let's do that. Um, and so we recorded drums. I do remember as we recorded Past Lives being really, really excited about how it was starting to sound, how it was starting to turn out. I was finally happy with like, how our sound was captured and I was like, yes. That, that's not a huge story though, I feel no. like, I don't know. I was hungover when I did it and Jesse yelled at me. I think we got it, we made CDs for them and I think the order on them was wrong. The order of songs on our CD was screwed up. Why was everything so difficult for Times Tide all the time? I think a lot of us felt like, hey, we need this good record to come out. It's gonna set us off because, you know, People know who we are now, they've heard about us, we just need an actual record. So, in my mind, the release show for Past Lives in the January 30th, 2015, was my favorite show, I think, of all of Times Tide's existence. things were starting to come together for our band. We go to Saskatoon for our first show in uh, 2015 at the end of June and that's when the forest fires all went nuts and it was so smoky in Saskatoon. We did not see the sun for th four days between Saskatchewan and Manitoba. We went to Winnipeg and we played on Canada Day and that was a pretty big show but Colton blew out his voice in Brandon 
the night before. It's like, we're never coming back to Brandon, Manitoba. We're never trying it again here. It's not a good place. Fuck Brandon, Manitoba. We made it to Kelowna, but Cold Lungs didn't make it to Kelowna. Their van blew up on the Coquihalla right outside of Merritt. So we had to like finish tour with them in our van and all their equipment, which was very tight. And Joel uh, had to go drive the van, pick them up, bring their gear, drive back with them in the middle of the night. I was filling in for mortality rate and I was only jammed with them a couple times. So like, yeah, I had made some like minor mistakes and stuff like obviously because we were touring with them, Colton knew and stuff. And so in Kelowna, uh, Colton and our buddy Don uh, stood on chairs in the back of the room. And uh, every time I made a mistake, they'd hold up their hands like this with the number. Like, oh, you made one mistake. Now it's two, now it's three. And every time they just like laugh. So of course, just like, it was throwing me off because then I'd make a mistake and just be like, fuck, and like, look at them. Everyone else in the band's in this like really intense, like breakdown moment. And then I'm just standing there playing bass with just this like huge smile on my face. And it's just cause yeah, like fucking looking at Colton and fucking Don, <laughs> like motherfuckers. <laughs> I remember mortality rate um, dropped me and Byron off on in the middle of the road in downtown Kelowna. And we had to walk to our place that we were staying. I think mentally we were kind of done at that point. <laughs> tour show it was in Collins garage on July 10th 2015 and that one was a ton of fun uh, just a big party Edmonton barbecue release for the, the seven inch that Andy put out for us and it was at uh, the local omnivore the chain gate show that was when uh, some of the Vancouver guys came moshed with a chain everybody got upset about it and kind of rightfully so in my opinion I think moshing with a chain was a little excessive the last thing that was in our hearts was to get our last record out with all of our last songs so in May of 2017, we went down to Calgary and we recorded with Liam, God I'm Alone Here, and it was our attempt at a full length. And he killed it. He, he was awesome to record with. I'm at, I remember it was mad hot in that studio. I don't think Liam was used to how like mean Colton and I can be to each other. It's always jokes and it's always like fine. A few times we were like going for donaires and Colton and I were just making comments towards each other and then just like laughing and like Liam was just kind of like oh and just like he couldn't tell if it was like if we were joking or not. Adam alone here was a lot, a lot more mature, but a lot more bitey. Um, it's really cynical and it's a big, just kind of attack on a lot of things in this scene that bother me. He 
he did an amazing job of recording us. I'm super proud of that record. I'm still super proud of that record. Um, but we were like, we can't afford to put it out on anything. So we just released it on Bandcamp and had a last show in November of 2017. I don't think it was like verbalized. I think it was just, we just kind of knew in the night's course. It's like days like this and moments like this and these points in your life that you're gonna like be nostalgic for and reflect on forever. It's like, yeah, like fuck. I don't think like Times Tide could have gone on without like the same people in the band, if that makes sense. Meeting those people really makes a difference in your life and having all these friendships to cherish and all these kinds of things, it's really important. And I'm incredibly grateful for Time Side and the things that it's been able to show me. Like Time Side is definitely one of the most important things that ever happened. Easy. So thanks guys. Some things are meant to happen. Punch out 316, baby.